Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today in our third session for our Fire Relief Fundraiser, third and final, I believe. So we are very excited to host three companies today who have very charitably donated to various relief causes for forest fire victims. As always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can find them on the company's websites. And there will be a Q&A section for each company, so feel free to input questions throughout the presentation. So next up, we have Sean Kunkun from Dolly Varden Silver. And Sean, I apologize, I've never met you before, so I hope I didn't butcher your name completely. No, you did not. And uh, thank you so much for having me on. And I echo some of Randy's comments about, um, you know, it's, it's, this is a great, uh, great cause that you're putting this together for. So thank you for, for this. Yeah, for sure. Um, And thanks for uh, participating. And just for the audience, the format will be a 20 minute presentation followed by Q&A if you're good with that, Sean. Why don't you take it away and tell us a bit about the Dolly Varden story? Again, thank you for for having me on. Grateful for your audience uh, in attendance today. And Dolly Varden, um, I I think it's important before we go into the company, the catalyst, the asset, uh, just from an overview, just just to personalize this for myself and my team. um, I've been in the business for 20 years and I've been an avid precious metals investor. And what I learned from 2004 to 2011 uh, help building a gold mining opportunity in, in the middle of the country in, in the province of Manitoba was that when, uh, when when you're in a gold precious metals bull market, silver outperforms. And so the reason myself and the team have gotten together behind Dolly Varden is we took over the company three years ago. And what Dolly represented then was a high grade, a silver project outside of areas that you predominantly normally see silver. Um, So 20% of the world's silver comes from pure silver mines. And most of those mines are in Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and Bolivia. So where Dolly Varden is unique is, again, there's only 20% of these companies that are that exist. And, you know, most silver gets produced as a byproduct. But the fact that we're in Canada makes us special and makes us unique. So um, I will be making some forward-looking statements and again, we're we're in the golden triangle, and this is a very very important slide because in mining, it's uh, like like some other businesses, like real estate, it is location, location, location. We're in an area that has seen a hundred years of production, over a hundred years of production. Uh, mineralization was first discovered here in the golden triangle in in and around eighteen in the eighteen sixties. And despite ice and despite a lack of infrastructure and despite low metal prices for, you know, up until the last 20 years, there's been production, steady production throughout the Golden Triangle. But fast forwarding into what's happening today, we have two operating mines in the Golden Triangle, and that is the Red Chris mine uh, up in the north here, and then the Bruce Jack mine. Uh, But apart from those mines, if we focus on the precious metals part of the Golden Triangle, you've got the famous Eskay Creek deposit and you've got uh, the Premier deposit. So back in the 1920s, the Premier deposit was was one of the most significant gold and silver mines on the planet. And then fast forwarding to uh, 1989, when Eskay Creek was discovered, the SK mine has produced over 200 million ounces of silver at over 2,400 grams per ton and about 3 million ounces of gold at 49 grams per ton gold. So, you know, just spectacular world-class deposits. And if I took a cursor and sort of put a circle around KSM and Bruce Jack, this represents the richest 20 kilometers on the planet for gold and silver mineralization. So where Dolly Varden is, Dolly Varden's just south of these historic projects, but we're set in the same host rock. And what I've really seen, in addition to all this great mineralization and all the great discoveries, and just to put those into context, prior to SK Creek, there had only been 5 million ounces of gold discovered in the Golden Triangle up until 1989. In the last 30 years we've seen 150 million more ounces of gold discovered. And so I really think that's an important uh, statistic and it's an important fact because 
It's really been only in the last six years where we now have the infrastructure. We've got a $700 million commitment that's come in to bring in clean hydroelectric power. We've got a deep water seaport. We've got higher metal prices. So there's a theme in the Golden Triangle of reawakening past treasures. And Dolly Varden is building upon that theme. So we're located in, in some of the in you know some of the greatest uh, host rock that's created some of the greatest deposits on the planet. Now for small companies, I really think it's all about team. And so when I took over this company, we were a $20 million market cap. I revamped the team. We're trading an evaluation today that's closer to $180 million in value. So we've seen a very difficult time in the last couple of years for junior miners. Dolly Varden has grown. And the part of the reason it's grown is we've got a world-class team that has sold junior mining companies to the likes of Kinross, to the likes of Igniko. We've got the right mix of scientists that know the rocks in the Golden Triangle and banking and entrepreneurs that know how to drive these companies forward when it comes to raising money and to move projects um, in, through exploration, through discovery, through development, ultimately into production and into sales in the hands of majors. So we've got a, a world-class team that has worked with companies like Coor, like Hecla, and um, and just, uh, you know, it's really the right skills and experience matrix to move this company forward. I really look at this slide as the foundation of the company. So looking at our shareholders, 93% uh, of the company is held by a select group of shareholders that have bought into management's vision for the company. And what that vision is, is we want to build a first class silver focused company that's growing mineral inventory. So when I took over the company, we had about, in all categories, about 40 million ounces um, today, we've got over 140, and we've grown through discovery. We've th grown through accretive acquisitions, and it's attracted the likes of Hecla, Eric Sprott, uh, institutional shareholders like Fidelity. And um, it's enabled us to perform quite well in terms of share price performance. It's enabled us to raise $65 million with this uh, group of investors. It's attracted some of the best analysts in the business, analysts Michael, like Michael Gray, who cover us. And I'm expecting more analysts to, to continue to cover. So we've got a great group of shareholders. Um, we've got a healthy treasury. But in terms of uh, some of the specifics, in terms of the business plan, the catalysts, um, none of that would be possible without our relationship with the Nishka. So our project is on the traditional territories of Nishka Nation. Now, in the Golden Triangle, where you've had 100 years of consistent operations, you've got two of the most progressive Indigenous groups on the planet, the Taltan in the north and the Nishka in the south. Our project is on Nishka territory. Our third of our workforce is from Nishka. We've got a phenomenal relationship with the nation. And uh, we're looking to advance this project for our shareholders, our stakeholders, the province, and the Nishka Nation. I should also mention that I'm a director of an organization called the BC Regional Mining Alliance, which is a partnership between government, uh, companies like Dolly Varden, and uh, First Nations partners like the Nishka. It's important to touch on the fact that the project has seen uh, past production. So cumulative, we've seen about 20 million ounces of silver produced on site. This was the richest silver mine in the British Empire. This was Canada's third largest silver producer. The grades at the Dolly Varden mine were over 1,100 grams per ton silver, so over a kilo average production grades at Dolly. And at the Torbert mine, which operated from 1949 to 1959, where almost 19 million ounces were produced, the average production grade was 466 grams per ton. So this tells me two things. Um, in addition to the metallurgical studies, the modern metallurgical studies we've done, um, which we're reporting silver recoveries in, in around 87, 88% recovery, we've, we've got that modern information, but we also have all the old production logs and records that tell us we can remove silver from the rock. It also tells me that the surrounding communities are very accepting to mining operations.
Now, some some view the Golden Triangle as a, a remote part of the world. And what I'm trying to highlight in this slide is we've got second to none infrastructure. So this red line that you see coming in from the east represents the BC Hydro, the hydroelectric power line that comes into Kitsault. Uh, this white line is a road that comes in from uh, a regional airport in Terrace. So we can drive to site. We've got power coming just uh, just south of the property. We've got a Highway 37 just to the north. So we've got a road network. We've got power. Um, however, how we get heavy equipment to site is we barge it into site. So we've got drill, an all-in drill cost that rivals jurisdictions like Nevada. And the reason for that is we barge in the heavy equipment. We drive it to site. So in addition to um, having the surface rights at Tidewater, where we house our camp, core storage facilities, we've also got a road and, and a special use permit to expand the road and to maintain the road. And so we drive this to site. We've, we have the ability to push that road to deposits. But at this point, we're focused on our capital on growing the resource. So Tremendous infrastructure. In, uh, this doesn't show it, but there's a Verify uh, presentation on our website if you'd like to check out. You can actually see the topography and you get a sense the fact that we're nestled into a valley. We're not at the side of a mountain. We're not at a high elevation. So it's very hospitable to work uh, for a longer season. And, uh, and like Randy mentioned at Independence Gold, we can go year round. We can go underground at Torbrit. What we've opted to do, though, for, for costs is, and even though we're in, in, you know, we had a very big drill program this year, 51,000 meters, we actually got it all done between May and October. And it's the most cost effective way to do it. So we had five drill rigs turning uh, 24 hours a day. And it was the most cost-effective way to um, to execute that drill program. And what's actually really interesting is we had budgeted for between forty-two and forty-five thousand meters, but we were able to accomplish fifty-one thousand meters because of efficiencies, because of the competence of the rock. Um, this slide here, it's a plan view on top. It's a long section below, just giving um, investors an idea of zonation of distribution of metals so and metal composition. So if you look at the north, you've got a gold silver deposit in the north, uh, which is the Homestake deposit, the Homestake main deposit, the Homestake silver deposit. So we've got a million ounce resource at Homestake Maine. And then the bulk of the silver resource is in the southern part of the property. What's interesting about this slide is the drilling that we've done previously was limited limited to about 300 meter depth. So there's a big opportunity to, to step below down dip of these deposits, extend them at depth. There's also a major opportunity in between deposits. And you'll probably note here, there's this five and a half kilometer gap. Um, when I first came into Dolly Varden, these four deposits made up the company. We've subsequently made an acquisition bringing the consolidation to the whole valley. And this unexplored area represents a big opportunity. And one of the things that we're seeing is there's a periodicity or a repeating pattern. So, you know, along that Kitsault Valley trend, there's cross cutting structures that bring in major deposits every kilometer and a half. So um, there is a good chance that we can fit another three depo major deposits within this gap zone. Looking at sort of our approach to exploration, so we look like look to triangulate, you know, the geology, the geochemistry, the geophysics, looking at all these modern opportunities. And again, like if you go back 100 years, explorers were mining here, explorers were making discoveries at a time where glaciers covered these properties at a time where there were no roads, um, there was no deep water seaport. And, and the reason for that was all these deposits come to surface. Now, the prospective horizon in the area is this Jurassic Age Hazelton formation, which we've outlined in green. 
And what the red line represents is there was uh, a couple of BCGS geologists, Joanne Nelson and uh, Jeff Kaiba. And this is known as the, the Kaiba Nelson red line. And what it represents is the major deposits in the Golden Triangle. So this is, you know, going north, Red Chris. This is Bruce Jack, it's KSM, it's Premier, it's SK. The major deposits in the Golden Triangle are located within two kilometers of these two different rock types. So it's the it's the uh, Triassic Age Stahini and it's the Jurassic Age Hazelton Formation. So what you're seeing here is we have a lot of perspective horizon to fit many more major deposits on our 100% owned land position. What's interesting though, is this black, um, almost tongue-like image here that comes over the green uh, Jurassic Age Hazelton. This is actually a sedimentary cap. And so in addition to raising money, in addition to bringing in more ounces through acquisition, the breakthrough moment happened at Dolly Varden when we drilled below that sedimentary cap. And it was a young geologist named Amanda Bennett who would come into the company and uh, she's our project manager. And she, she looked at all the old historic data going back to the 1930s and, 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 and the activity that occurred in the 50s and the 80s. And she looked at various parts of the project. So she focused on the Wolf deposit, which is one of our seven deposits. And she saw that the, the mineralization was open. However, nobody had drill tested that mineralization to, for an extension because it was below this upper Hazelton sedimentary cap. And the thinking was, as you can see in the past image, we were where this sedimentary cap comes in, we're essentially blind to what's happening below the cap. So, you know, the geochemistry doesn't light up, the geophysics um, don't penetrate it. So when we drill below that cap and we we hit, you know, and initially it was a, it was a 94 meter step out, which was we then followed up on and we followed up again. And now what we have is we have a total of 950 meters of strike length. And what was a nine meter vein at surface is now almost a 30 meter vein at depth. And the grades are consistent. So we're seeing you know, 381 grams. Now we estimate this true width to be about 22 meters. So, and this is still open and, and we've got drill results that are pending as we look to continue to extend this mineralization. I also want to note one of the best drill intercepts and it was just drilled last season. So this is a property that's been around for hundred years and our team has come in and we drilled 1,500 grams of silver over 16 meters. So we've had some tremendous success with the drill bit, with growing, with expanding. And uh, I attribute that success to people on the team like Amanda, because unlike the old Dolly Varden that relied on third-party consultants, we've built a team in-house that are dedicated, that are aligned with our shareholders, and it's, um, it's translated into success in the field. And part of that success was on the gold side, where we drilled 27 grams of gold and 463 grams of silver over nine meters at, up at Homestake. And the best hole in the Golden Triangle last year came from Dolly Varden Silver. It was a gold intercept, 46 grams of gold over 25 meters. And what we're really focused on at Dolly is we've got this 140 million ounce silver equivalent resource at close to 400 grams silver equivalent and 50% of its silver, 50% of its gold, we've got a, a cutoff grade on the Dolly Varden side at 150 grams per ton silver cutoff. The average grade is 300 grams per ton. The cutoff grade is 150. You know, if we were to drop that cutoff grade, we could incorporate a lot more ounces. That's not our interest. Our focus is economic ounces, that um, have a high grade component, and we are focused on growing high grade gold and silver mineralization. Now there is some lead and zinc in the in the system on the silver side. Uh, it's pretty uh, minor on the Dolly side. There is a copper component on the gold side, but when we talk about our resources, we only 
um, talk about the gold and silver. So you're getting real exposure as a silver and gold investor to the precious metals here. So fast forwarding to what's happening today at Dolly Barton and what's to come. So we started this 42 to 45,000 meter drill program. We've drilled 51,000 meters. We've reported 10,000 meters of results um, that the drill intercept I showed you at Wolf was the last news release we put out on the 11th of September. We also had some results out that I'll get into in, in August. But essentially, the way I want you to look at this opportunity is we've got the Torbert deposit, which represents a 50 million ounce silver deposit. The question I had to the team was, how many of these deposits exist on the land position? And the Wolf deposit represents an opportunity where it could be the next Torbert. And that's what we've seen with all this step out success and growth. And the, and the, the next question we have is, how many more of these do we have on the land position? Is Moose the next one? We've got some results pending for Moose. Is Chance? Is Ace Galena? If we could, if we could get five or six of these deposits to demonstrate that size of quantity of silver potential, this becomes a world class silver opportunity. It's already got a significant amount of endowment at great grades, which actually make it the only project in North America that has this size of endowment. At these grades, it's the only one giving investors um, a lot of leverage to a lot of silver, a lot of gold at these grades. Now, the other question, in addition to trying to grow 50 million ounce silver deposits, is we have one, one, one million ounce gold deposit. The challenge for the team is to find another one. We've got results pending from Red Point. And, you know, our hope is that Red Point demonstrates it's the next homestake main. Now, at a high level in terms of goals, in terms of unanswered questions, when I first came into Dolly, we had 40 million ounces of silver. The question was, could we take it to 100 million ounces? Today, we're at 140. The next question is, uh, is this a billion ounce silver camp? And again, outside of our property in the neighborhood, there's been over a billion ounces of silver discovered. There's been over 155 million ounces of gold discovered. We've got a very prospective land position that's delivering new discoveries um, regularly. And so we've, we believe we've got tremendous potential to unlock, but we've got this fundamental resource that backstops value. Now, the other question is, in addition to major deposits every kilometer and a half, are any of these deposits connected? So one of the goals is to get out there on the other side of some of these faults and to show that there's a relationship between existing deposits. And if we look at this high-grade vein, the Kitsol vein, which is part of this Torbert deposit, and one thing that makes Dolly special, in addition to the high-grade, in addition to these big, wide intercepts, what you have here is you have a project that's 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 got these wide, robust veins that may potentially be amenable to bulk mining methods, which is going to reduce our costs. But in addition to that, you've got these, you know, you've got this these super rich veins like Kitsol. Um, and when we look at some of the results here, so this was a, a release that we put out on August the 8th of this year where we drilled the Kitsol vein and we tried to see if it was extending right to surface and we were successful and we drilled 342 grams of silver over 18 meters. So that was one of the highlight holes. And again, just demonstrating robust grades, good mineable widths. These are our current resources. So these resources represent um, technical reports that incorporated the drilling that was done up until 2019. We've subsequently drilled 100,000 meters of drilling. Now, of that 100,000 meters, there's about 40,000 meters to report. And so we've got a tremendous amount of catalysts. What I'm expecting from October through to February is on a monthly basis, maybe even twice a month, getting out news release news releases of discovery-oriented drill results. Now, for me, when it comes to Companies and goals like in, in the stock market, whether you're, you know, your Walmart or your Tesla or your Dolly Varden, it's all about growth. 
The reason we've been growing in terms of market cap, in terms of share price, is because we're growing mineral inventory. The way we're doing that is through drilling, through discovery. We're also open to acquisitions, which the team has successfully pulled off within this company. And, um, you know, despite markets going up and down, the team has done a really good job. When the markets pulled back, we went out and we made an acquisition. When the markets went up, we filled the treasury. So we've been very thoughtful and strategic on how we've advanced the business. We've created a tremendous culture within the company. We're offering shareholders a vehicle, a proxy to rising metal prices, but we've had success in growing both the market cap and share price, despite metal prices being flat. So I think um, you know what I've accomplished here and what the team's accomplished since taking over is we've now got a company that's liquid, that's now in the SIL, the SILJ, the silver ETFs. It tracks nicely to the silver price. It's giving investors a vehicle for growth. And it represents a very rare opportunity in the market where when investors go to invest in silver, there's very few options. There's even fewer options. And and one of the things I'll I'll note here, and I'll I'll reference one of our largest shareholders, which is Hecla Mining. Hecla has been one of the best performing silver companies in the last three years. And the reason for that, in my opinion, is they're focused on safe jurisdictions. They're America's largest silver miner. They're soon to be Canada's. And we are, we represent those same principles, high grade, safe jurisdiction, and there's a, a significant resource here. And so I think with that, Deborah, I've concluded my presentation and happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. That was really thorough. And you actually answered a lot of my questions. So I'm going to have to wing it with you <laughs> a little bit. There was one thing that I didn't completely understand with your strategy, just uh, with the different potential deposits. Are you looking at a hub and spoke type strategy to mine these? Or, or maybe you could just explain that a little bit better. Yeah, there's there's two types of hub and spoke strategies. There's the there's the there's the Dolly Varden 100% on land package where you've got these seven deposits. Are they linked? Or is it one system? At this point, they're separate deposits. So there's, you know, what we envision in the future is one central facility and, and feeding. So yes. But then if we take a step back, and I really, you know, my whole bit career in this business in 20 years, I really, you know, I joke and I say I never had an original idea. And I look at, you know, what's led to success, how people did things in the past. And if you look at BC, for instance, and you look just south of us at Antioch. So Antioch was the site of um, of where a lot of material went to process. If you go back to the Dolly Varden Silver Project, the Torbert Mine, the Torbert or, you know, Concentrate went to um, Antioch. So if you take a step out and you zoom out, um, you know, we're actually exploring a hub and spoke strategy that's bigger than Dolly Varden. And so we signed an MOU with the Nishka Nation and a few other companies in the region looking at, um, you know, instead of building, you know, multiple sites where you've got, you know, you know, you're from an environmental standpoint, you're monitoring multiple sites from a, from a capital standpoint, you're building multiple sites, but looking at one site, like they did it in the past, where you could then pull multiple deposits, and some of them are held by different co- um, companies. But so it, it and it, this is how it's done everywhere else in the world, not just in BC. It's this is how it's done in Australia. This is how it's done, you know, throughout the world. Um, and so, yeah, the, the hub and spoke model is something that um, I think that a lot of North American focused investors. Um, are, are are sort of warming up to in the last decade or so. And it's something where I think we can really reduce costs and from like, you know, multiple standpoints, environment and so on, uh, it makes the most sense. And when talking about other assets for the hub and spoke model, are you talking about like toll milling or would you acquire those assets or a combination of? That's a, that's a really good question. I don't know where Dolly Varn's going to end up in terms of are we going to be prey or are we going to be predator? Are we going to be the, you know, so far we've taken the leadership role and we've made a very significant acquisition in acquiring Homestake. It was a $50 million transaction for a company. What When it started it was a $20 million company. We're happy to continue to take that lead. But, um, and so whether it's keeping 
that ownership within existing companies or it's bringing in, we're open to both opportunities. At the end of the day, we ask ourselves a very simple question. What's in the best interest? It sounds corny, but it's true. What's in the best interest of our shareholders and what makes the most sense? And if that's a roll-up strategy, if that's staying independent, we're all, we're constantly, and we're doing those desktop studies with engineers right now, looking at, you know, those cases right now. Okay. That helps me understand just a little bit better the, the core strategy. And we're coming up right on the hour. So I appreciate you taking the time. You've got, I think, one of the largest drill programs that I've heard of this year going on. So sounds like you're going to have a ton of news flow for investors over the coming months. So exciting times for Dolly Bard and shareholders, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a great cause. and We're happy to participate. Yeah, thanks for your participation and nice to finally meet you. I've heard your name and obviously heard of the story. So good to uh, put a face to a name. Likewise. Thanks for participating.